Welcome survivors to the Kingdom Death Monster tutorial. Kingdom Death Monster is a campaign based survival and hunting game for one to four players. The goal of the game is to survive as many years as possible by hunting monsters and harvesting their resources to craft better gear for yourself as well as innovate a settlement which is the home for all of your survivors. Now before we begin, let me just start by saying Kingdom Death Monster is an incredibly complex game with so many minute rules and cards and special instances that there's no way I could ever reasonably explain all the rules inside of it within one short video. And if you happen to be lucky enough to have this game yourself, you'll notice that at the very beginning of this book, it starts you off with a tutorial, which explains a lot of the core rules of the game and is a great introduction to how to play. The purpose of this video though is for those of you who may not have the book in your hands and are interested to learn how to play the game or learn more about it to inform your decision on whether or not you want to get this game for yourself. So let me start by saying that this game has three phases to it. A hunt phase where the players will go out and complete a series of random events before actually fighting the monster. The showdown phase which is the bulk of the game where you actually fight the monster. And then the settlement phase, when you return back to your settlement, whether or not you succeed or fail, and determine what to do with the resources you may or may not have harvested from there. At the end of the settlement phase is usually a good time for a single session to end, where you can record all of your progress for the next session. In this demonstration, I'm going to start with the showdown phase because this is the biggest phase of the game. And I'm going to use survivors that are already a year or two into their campaigns, so they have a little bit of gear. When you're ready to begin the showdown with the monster, you're going to need to gather all the cards that are relevant to it, which include the hunt cards, the AI cards, the hit location cards, and the monster specific resource deck, as well as this double sided basic action card for the monster. Because we're doing the showdown phase, we don't need this hunt deck, and so we can put this back in the box. The rare resource deck can be off to the side. We may need it during the fight, but we'll definitely need it afterwards if we're successful in hunting the monster. The hit location deck can be shuffled and placed on this hit location spot on the monster control board. And then we're going to need to take the AI cards here and build our monster's behavior deck. Because every time we fight this monster, each one may behave slightly differently than all the others. Now when you hunt monsters, you pick a level, and this is determined before you actually go out to hunt it. So the level will remain consistent. So let's say we're fighting a level one white lion. Here it says I need seven B cards and three A cards. I don't need any L cards, and it will also show me the monster's movement value and its toughness, which I'll get into what those mean later. So we can take our AI cards and sort them into letters. The letters can be found in the top right of the card. Here I have my basic cards, my advanced cards, and my legendary and special cards, which I would not need for a level one white lion. Simply take one of these piles, shuffle them, and draw as many cards as required for the level of the monster you're hunting. The rest of the unused cards can go back in the box. Take all the piles you need to create your monster's behavior deck, shuffle it, and then place it on the AI spot on the monster control board. Lastly, all you need to do now is memorize the monster's movement and toughness, then you can flip it to its basic action side and place it in the basic action spot on the monster control board. In order to set up our showdown, we need to turn to the page of the book for the monster that we're hunting. Here I'm going to set up a white lion. And you can see here in the right, it says story event showdown white lion. These events are ordered alphabetically with a few exceptions in the back. So you can quickly find the story events you're looking for in the book. So there's a diagram here on the right that says showdown setup. Below that it will say terrain and deployment. Here it describes how many terrain cards you need to set up during this showdown. 
Some monsters may require specific terrain, while others may have you determine the cards randomly. For the white lion, it says we need specifically one tall grass terrain card. And on this card, it says that we need two tall grass tokens. So I'll find the two tokens from the box and set them off to the side. Then it says to draw two random terrain cards set up normally. We'll draw two random cards, grab their tiles from the box, and set them off to the side. If you look at a terrain card, it shows you which tokens you need to grab for the card itself, any special effects the terrain will have during the game, any abilities that can be activated by the monster or by players, and how to set it up on the board. Tall grass says it needs to be set up four spaces from other tall grass. This pillar says it needs to be at least five spaces away from the monster. And this corpse says it needs to be six spaces away from all other terrain, at least. We can place these cards off to the side so that we don't forget their abilities and their effect on the game. The diagram in the book says the monster is placed directly in the center of the board. Which direction the monster is facing isn't entirely important at the very beginning of the game, but I always orient this so that the monster is always facing downward. When determining spaces, you count spaces in cardinal directions. There are no diagonals in this game. So five spaces away would be one, two, three, four, five. And the player can go here. Or one, two, three, four, five. And the player could go like that. How you place the terrain is completely up to you unless the book specifically directs you on how to place the terrain. After placing the terrain, you would place the monster where it says in the diagram and then you'd place survivors however you would like within the designated spaces in the diagram. Now that our showdown is set up, we're ready to begin. Every showdown, unless otherwise specified, begins with the monster's turn. During the monster's turn, you will take the top card of the AI deck, draw it, and resolve it. So let's break down how a monster AI card looks like. A monster's AI card is broken up into sections, divided by this arrow here that you can see. Each section will kind of work like code. Here at the top, it says pick target. This section is entirely about how the monster is going to pick a target. At the top of this, it says the closest threat facing in range will be the target. So as you can imagine, closest threat is whomever is the closest. And because this is the beginning of the showdown, I actually know that all of these survivors are exactly six spaces away from the lion. Because remember, spaces are counted in cardinal directions. Even though it looks like this redhead is closer, She's actually one, two, three, four, five, six spaces away. Just like this person who is three, six spaces away, three, four, five, six spaces away. So they all count. But then it says facing. The monster is facing is everything that is in front of the monster and the line divides at the forward edge of its base. So actually, this survivor doesn't count because he is not in the monster's facing. So now we have a three-way tie between these three survivors. Whenever there's a tie, the players will be able to determine the result. But let's pretend these three survivors were actually behind the monster. And so the monster had no targets that were facing and in range of the monster. And then we would look at the next bullet, which then says closest threat in field of view. And field of view is everything on the board except for the monster's blind side. The monster's blind side is a diagram that's in the rule book. If we look here, the blind spot of the monster are the two spaces directly behind it. So if these three survivors were behind here, all of them would be eligible targets because they're all the closest threat within the monster's field of view. But if that wasn't the case as well, we'd go down the node again and it says no target sniff which is an action that's on the monster's behavior card here. But anyway, we get to pick a target between our eligible three survivors here. Let's just say the blue hair will take it. 
we look at the next section that says move and attack the target. So every time the monster moves, it tries to move the shortest distance to get to its target. If there are multiple paths that are the shortest distance, the survivors get to choose which path the monster takes. And this is important because there's a big difference between, say, one, two, three, four, five, and then turn to face its target, compared to one, two, three, four, five. So how you move the monster is up to you. It may be possible that during a monster's move, it passes over a survivor on the way. If this happens, the survivor will be knocked down. If a survivor is knocked down, they cannot perform any actions during their turn until they stand back up. Normally, a survivor will stand back up at the end of the monster's next turn. If the monster were to land on top of the survivor, first you would knock the survivor backwards away from the monster five spaces. These are counted directly away from the monster in a straight line. So one, two, three, four, five, and then they are knocked down. But fear not, there are ways to get a survivor back off the ground before the end of the monster's next turn. But I'll talk about that later. Once the monster has moved and has ended its movement within range of its target, it'll then attack said target. Now, here we have the box for the properties of this attack. It has a speed of two, an accuracy of four, and damage of one. Speed refers to how many dice you'll roll. So speed of two means you roll two dice. Accuracy is the number you need to roll on each of those dice to be considered a hit. So that means each roll of a four or greater will produce a successful hit. And this is where you have to use some strategy and prepare for the monster. Now luckily this blue haired survivor has some gear that gives them extra evasion. And they're sitting in the tall grass which gives them additional evasion. What evasion does is that it makes it harder for the monster to hit you. And for every point of evasion you have, it'll add to the accuracy required for that attack to generate a hit. So adding my bonuses together, the blue hair character has four evasion. Adding that to the four accuracy means that the monster now can only hit me on a roll of eight or greater, which is great because everything in this game is trying to kill you. So you need to do everything in your power besides cheat in order to get the upper hand. So we'll take the dice and we'll roll them. Two fives means that the monster misses, but if the monster rolled an eight, a nine, or a 10, they would generate a hit. And for every hit they generate, you need to determine where the monster has hit their target by rolling one of these six sided hit location dice. So if we had two hits here, we'll take two hit location dice and roll them. Then we will refer to the survivor's character sheet and we're specifically looking at this bottom left corner that shows the armor that character is wearing. This is filled out when the survivors leave the settlement to go out on the hunt. And the numbers here show how much armor the survivor has at a specific location. Now if we look at our dice, we rolled hands and body. And the damage for this attack is one. So that means this monster is gonna do one damage to the hands and to the body. Luckily, the survivor is well armored and they have an armor value of two and an armor value of two in the body and in the hands. So what we'll do is subtract the amount of damage from the armor we have at that location. So the arms goes to one and the body goes to one. If, let's say, the monster were to attack the body again, twice even, I have one armor left at the body, I would reduce it to zero because I'm taking one more damage. But then if I'm taking more damage on top of that, I would have to start filling in these boxes here 
to the right of that hit location. And if you fill in the far rightmost box of that hit location, you'll notice that it has a black border around it. These black border boxes usually signify an event. And the event specifically for this box is depicted here. It's a heavy injury, which means the character will be knocked down. Just like that. And if the survivor were to take another point of damage, while there is no more armor left at that hit location and no more boxes left to fill in, they would then suffer a severe injury at that location. When this happens, you'll have to flip to the page in the book that has all the severe injuries, roll a d10, and hope you do not die. So the less damage you take and the less times you have to roll on this table, the better. But moving on, we'll then refer to the next section left on this AI card, and it says if this attack deals damage more than once, draw an AI card. So we could possibly suffer another attack. There's also this box here at the bottom that has this exclamation point. This is situational. This will only apply if a certain condition has been fulfilled. And the condition in this scenario is lost hand. Which means if a card is revealed that says that the monster has lost their hand, then this effect would apply. But that hasn't happened yet, nor have we seen that card. So we don't know how exactly the monster can lose their hand. But anyway, once they're done resolving their attack, you then discard the card in the appropriate spot on the monster's control board. Once the monster finishes its turn, then it is the player's turn to activate all the survivors in any order that they choose. But once you start activating a survivor, you must complete their activation before moving on to the next survivor. You do this until all survivors have acted and then it is back to the monster's turn. So the players get to choose which survivor acts. And when a survivor is activated, they get one movement point and one interaction point. A movement point is exactly what it sounds like. You spend it and then you get to move up to your survivor's movement value. A basic survivor's movement is five. And when you move a survivor, you don't get to interrupt its movement with actions in between. Even if you didn't move the survivor's full available movement. So here the redhead survivor would like to go. And they will move five. One, two, three, four, five, and that's it. Then they'll spend their interaction point to activate one of the weapons they have equipped. This is what a weapon looks like in the game. At the top here we see this lightning bolt icon, which is the symbol for an interaction point, which means that you need to spend an interaction point in order to activate this card. Then you'll see the stats for the card itself. There's three numbers here. At the top we have the weapon speed. It works the same way as the monster. The second number is the weapon's accuracy, which works the same way as the monster. But the number below that is the number's strength modifier. So if we were to go through this, the red hair survivor is attacking the monster. The speed of the weapon is two, so we're rolling two dice. And the accuracy is six plus, which means we need to roll a six or better in order to generate a successful hit. But if you remember, the monster has a blind side, which we saw in the book. And the blind side is the two spaces directly behind it. If you're performing an attack in the monster's blind side, you get plus one to your accuracy, which means now I generate a successful hit on a five plus instead of a six plus. So we'll roll our dice and try to get hits on fives. And this game is very harsh, but let's say I did generate two hits. For every hit you generate, you draw one card from the hit location deck. This details where exactly you're hitting the monster, and any special effects that may arise from doing so. So we've generated our two hit locations. Now we need to determine whether or not we can wound said locations. To do this, we'll try to wound each location one after another by rolling a dice and trying to roll equal to or greater than the monster's toughness. Now if you remember on the monster's behavior card, the toughness of this white lion at level 1 is 8, which means we need to roll an 8 or better. That's pretty tough, 
but thankfully, we get to add the strength modifier of the weapon we're using to this roll. And if you remember, the weapon modifier of this blade is two, which means now I need to roll a six or better. So now that we know the number we're trying to roll, we need to pick the order in which we resolve these cards, which is important because if we look at this card here, it has two parts, a reaction at the top and a critical wound effect at the bottom. The reaction at the top means that the monster may potentially react based on how we wound or don't wound this location. Here it says specifically, if you fail to wound this location, the monster will perform this specific ability. And that's important because if we fail, it means the monster will move forward. And it specifically says, after the monster moves, cancel all hits that are now out of range means if the monster moves forward like that, I can't then resolve this hit location because the monster's gone. So in order to avoid that, I'd rather attempt to wound this location that doesn't have a negative on whether or not I fail to wound this. So there's no risk. The other reactions that are out there are on successful wound, so the exact opposite of a failure, the reaction will take place. Another reaction is on reflex, which means whether or not you even successfully wound or not, the reaction will take place. So make sure you look at each of the reactions on all the hit location cards in front of you to determine the best order to attempt to wound these locations. So we'll roll our dice and try to beat the monster's toughness with our strength modifier. I rolled a four and that is unsuccessful. Unfortunately, we'll take this card and discard it to the appropriate spot on the monster control board. And then we'll resolve our next hit location. And I got a six, which means six plus two is equal to or greater than the monster's toughness and that is a successful wound. When you successfully wound the monster, you take the top card of the AI deck and discard it to the wound stack on the monster control board without looking at it, which means the monster now is one health lower and now has lost an attack it could potentially use against you. When the monster deck runs out of cards and is reduced to zero, it'll die on the next damage that it takes once it's hit that zero point, which means the more damage you do, the less moves it has to use against you. But it also means it's probably gonna be using the same moves over and over once it enters that critical zone. And speaking of criticals, let's look at what this critical effect here at the bottom means. Now, when you're attempting to wound a location like this and you happen to roll a natural 10, you critically wound that location. But it's worth noting that not all cards may have critical wound effects here at the bottom. But because this one does, it says, on a critical wound, cancel the reaction on this card. It does not happen and instead a special effect will happen. In this case, it says the trauma of the impact fractures the white lion's shoulder and the white lion gains minus one movement token, which means for the rest of the fight, the monster is now impaired and has one less movement. Some critical wound injuries out there can do devastating things to the monster beyond just impairing their stats. So while rolling a one can be devastating and cause instant death, to your survivors, rolling a natural 10 can be an exciting turn of events for the survivors. Now those are the bare basics of the game. Once all the survivors have gone, it goes back to the monster's turn. If it's the monster's turn and the monster has no cards in its deck, but it still has cards in its discard, you'll take the discard, reshuffle it back into the deck, and continue play like that. If the monster has no cards in its deck and no cards in its discard, then it will perform the basic action on its behavior card. And that's the basics of the showdown. But let's talk about some interesting tools that the survivors have at their disposal. And it's a resource known as survival. Think of it like energy or mana or stamina, whatever you want to call it. It's a special resource that the survivors gain throughout the campaign that they can spend at key moments to do special abilities. The abilities you'll have though 
are determined by the innovations you developed at your settlement, which we'll talk about later. But let me get into detail about survival and the survival actions. So if you remember the monster's AI card, each of these sections were broken up by this arrow. This arrow is a pause. And during this pause, it is possible for you to activate a survival ability. For example, there is a survival ability known as Dash. If you spend a survival, you get a movement point that you get to spend immediately. And let me tell you why that's super important. So let's say we had this AI card be drawn. And let's say the monster was here. And it has to pick a target. So he picks his target based on the criteria. Let's pretend that blue haired survivor is going to be our target. Before the monster moves and attacks said target, there's that pause. So during that pause, we can spend a survival to activate dash, which gives them a point of movement that they get to activate immediately. So blue hair survivor will spend it now and they'll dash and they'll move five spaces away. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, the survival action is complete. And now we move to the monster's next section, move and attack the target. The blue hair survivor was designated as a target in the previous section and is still the target now. So now the monster is trying to move closer, but can't get there. If the survivor didn't move prior to, she would have been enraged and would have gotten attacked. But now, thanks to the survival ability, she is no longer in range and the monster's turn is now over. And that is the perfect time for the other survivors to jump in and start attacking. But there is a caveat. Each survival ability can only be used once per round. And a round consists of a monster turn and a survivor turn, which means this same survivor couldn't use that same ability during their turn because it would still be considered the same round. To quickly go down the list of other survival actions you can perform, there is Surge. Spend a survival point to get an interaction point that you can spend immediately. The most obvious choice to use that for is to attack twice. Another survival action is to encourage. Spend a point and stand up a survivor who is not deaf. So that's a good idea to help your teammates who have been knocked down. And lastly, you have dodge. Whenever the monster hits a survivor and rolls a hit location dice, just like this, you can spend one point of survival to entirely dodge one of those dice. It's just gone. But like I said, you can only use once per round, so pick wisely. You can use these survival actions during these pauses in the monster's activation, in between actions on a survivor's turn, immediately after a monster is knocked down, or even after attempting to wound a location, but before resolving the reaction on that hit location. So these abilities are powerful, but are limited by the number of survival you have and limited by when you can use them. But unfortunately, I'm gonna have to end this one on a low note because the monster has something else up its sleeve and that is known as a trap. In this deck, there is a card known as the trap hit location. When you draw it, it'll tell you what exactly you're supposed to do, but it is almost always bad. And what's worse about it is, let's say you have a high number of attacks that have hit. Let's say you hit three times and you think, oh great, I get to attempt three wounds on the monster. Draw once, draw twice, draw ah. When you draw the trap card, you unfortunately have to cancel out the rest of the hit locations and instead have to resolve the trap card. So the survivors really need to do their best to plan out how they're gonna attack the monster as much as they can while trying to avoid drawing the trap card. It's an inevitability, but it's one you wanna minimize. But as I mentioned, once the monster is dead, congratulations. In the book, it tells you what to do when the monster dies and what cards to draw from the box. Usually it'll say you get to draw a number of specific monster resources, based on its level and a number of basic resources based on its level. 
Keep these and put them off to the side because you'll need them during the settlement phase. You can clean up the rest of the board and put the monster specific cards back in the box. Next we move on to the settlement phase. When it's the settlement phase, we'll set up our settlement phase board here, put our survivors off to the side, and make a note that these are the returning survivors. Then we'll gain a number of endeavors equal to the number of survivors that survived the previous hunt. And there's even some tokens to help track this. If a survivor unfortunately died in the previous hunt, don't worry. Even if they're dead, the gear that they had magically finds its way back to the settlement. You just won't get an endeavor for that survivor, and unfortunately that survivor is permanently dead. So if they had any good abilities or stats, they're gone forever now. So I hope you won't attach to them. The next thing you'll do is update the timeline on your settlement record sheet. As the name implies, this is a record of the accomplishments of your survivors, the gear and resources they have available, and the innovations they have made, as well as tracking how many years that they have survived in the campaign. So during this stage of the settlement phase, we update the timeline by finding the next box in our timeline section here and filling it in. After we fill it in, we'll see this icon here. This is a settlement event. To resolve this, there's a deck of settlement event cards here. Shuffle it and pull one at random. These events can range from good things like a stranger visiting your settlement and selling you their goods to a plague happening when you return back to the settlement and half of your settlement is dead. The effects can vary wildly, but they will usually require you to make decisions or roll on tables or provide opportunities to spend these endeavors. After resolving the settlement event, you'll look at that year in the timeline and see if there are any icons that look like this. This is a story icon. If this appears next to the settlement event icon, it means you need to find that event in the book by flipping to its appropriate page and then resolving whatever it asks you to do. The other icon we find here is this nemesis encounter. This means during this year, you will encounter a nemesis, which is the same as a showdown, but this fight happens during your settlement phase and the rules are slightly different. As you can see here on this board, there's a special section here for special showdown and this tells you when that special fight happens. If a nemesis encounter doesn't happen during your year, then don't worry about it. It doesn't happen and you can rest easy. But if it does, it's an extra fight outside of the regular monster fights that you do every year. After you resolve all those events during the update timeline stage of the settlement phase, you then update the death count. If a survivor died, you update the death count here in the top right. Make sure you remove that survivor's name in the population section and that's the end of that. Then you check the milestones. There are a number of milestone events here on your settlement record sheet that happen at specific points during the campaign. Here, some can happen if your first child has been born, the first time the death count is updated, when you reach 15 population, or when your settlement has five innovations. After you reach these milestones, it'll then refer you to a story event in the book, which you open to and resolve, same as normal. These milestone events can also be found on your character sheet. When your character has reached a certain level of hunt experience or a certain amount of courage or understanding and even weapon proficiency. It is at this point that you would resolve all those milestones now in the order of your choosing. After you've done that, then you developed. And this is when you take the resources that you fought so hard for and turn them into gear. Over the course of your campaign, you'll add locations to your settlement. You start with this location called a Lantern Horde, but over the course of the campaign you'll eventually develop and even find new locations, and each of these locations will offer a wide variety of gear. For example, here we have the Skinnery, and says that we can make raw hide headbands and gloves and vests and bandages and all sorts of other things if we spend these specific resources. 
if we look at the resources that we've acquired, they will have a name at the top and a type. The different types we have are hides, bones, and organs. Those are the three most important kinds. There are other ones, such as scrap, vermin resources, and strange resources. But you'll discover what those are when you encounter them later in the game. There are some recipes that require a specific resource. For example here, the white lion hound specifically requires white fur and a great cat bone. Unfortunately, I don't have either of those resources. I only have a lion claw and a shimmering mane. Those don't count and so I can't make that gear. Usually the monster resources can double as different things. It counts as a shivering mane and it counts as a hide. But some resources may even have special abilities here that says if you archive this, i.e. put this back in the box, you can gain two basic hide resources. So like I said, this is the, the second biggest part of the game where you and your team get to determine how you spend your resources and how you spend your endeavors. But what exactly are endeavors? Endeavors are like action points. And there might be some locations here that require the use of these endeavors. It's possible that you also revealed a settlement event that has potential uses for your endeavors. But one of the most important things you can use them for is to innovate. Over the course of the game, you will create something known as an innovation deck. These are the upgrades you are adding to this settlement, similar to these locations but these upgrades that you develop will have permanent effects for your campaign. They might be something like, every time you leave the settlement, everybody gets plus one survival, which is a very handy effect to have. Some increase the limit of survival a single survivor may have. Some innovations may even offer opportunities to spend endeavors. They are great to have and you should almost always innovate at every opportunity you can because you can only innovate once per settlement phase. So for example here, if I were to innovate, I have to spend an endeavor, a bone, an organ, and a hide. Great. Then it says I get to draw two cards and pick one. I discuss with my team which innovation I think is better and we decide to add one to our active innovations. The other one gets put back in the deck. So now this innovation is in effect and available for the settlement but we'll also have to add drums consequences to the innovation deck. Consequences isn't always a bad thing. All it simply means is that now that we've discovered how to use this innovation, it has opened up the possibility to develop new innovations based on that technology. So I have a larger innovation deck here that is separate from the innovation deck of my campaign. And I have to look for all the innovations that have the consequence listed here. So if I discover the drums, I now have to put Song of the Brave and Forbidden Dance, both of which are listed as drum consequences, into my innovation deck so that they can possibly be pulled later on in the campaign when I decide to innovate next time. It's essentially a tech tree if you're familiar with that concept. Once you finish developing whether or not you've decided to use all your resources or some of them, you will then bank the rest of them into your sediment storage. So let's pretend I decide to use all these cards except for a broken lantern and a monster hide. Everything else got consumed and I put them back in the box. Now is a good time for me to stop playing. It is at this point that we can record any resources we haven't used in our storage and record all the gear that we've discovered and crafted and record all the innovations we've created and any new survivors we've added or removed from the settlement. And then we can say, we're done. And that's fine. So that the next time my group and I are ready to play, we can pick right back up from this point. So let's pretend it's the next day, we're here and are ready to start anew. We would prepare departing survivors. We'll look through the available survivors we have, look through any character sheets we've already created, pick the survivors that we want to take out and then look at all the gear in our storage and decide how we want to equip our survivors. Gear is not permanently attached to a specific survivor unless otherwise stated. 
So it's in your best interest to spread your gear out generously and wisely. Now that we know which survivors are gonna go out to the next hunt and we've equipped them well enough, if we have a special showdown to do, we would fight that monster. We would look at what the settlement says, which specific monster we're fighting, refer to that part in the book, and set it up just like a normal showdown. If we're not doing a special showdown, then we pick a monster from our available list of quarries. Here in the bottom right section of the settlement record sheet, we have available quarries. Because at the very beginning of the game, you can only hunt the white lion, and you have to discover how to hunt the other monsters later. Also, you may have purchased expansions for the game, and each of those expansions comes with a specific book for that expansion itself. And in that book, it describes how to add the expansion content into your campaign and whether or not this monster is now available to hunt as a quarry also. But anyway, you pick a monster and you pick a level. Let's say we're going for a white lion level two or a screaming antelope level one, doesn't matter. After you've picked, you can then clean this board of all this sediment junk and set up the monster's hunt board. To set up the monster's hunt board, we have another tertiary board here to set up. We'll lay this out on the table and refer back to the monsters page in the book. Here in the top right, we have their hunt board set up. It looks just like this and it'll have some E's along the spaces of the board. Those E's mean that we have to take one of the monster specific hunt cards and place them on the board in the same locations as instructed by that diagram. Then we take the generic hunt event deck and place them in the remaining spaces. Skipping the start space, the overwhelming darkness space, and the starvation space on the far right. Then we take our monster and place them on the spot of the board that matches their level as shown in the diagram in the book. If we're hunting a level one white lion, it says to place the white lion in this space. If we're hunting a level two white lion, it says to place that one in this space. Let's say we're hunting a level one. Then we place our survivors here at the start and we're ready to begin the hunt phase. The hunt phase is kind of like a choose your own adventure where you don't have any choice. To start us off, you pick a survivor to be the event revealer. You take them and you move them onto the space. Then you take the card and read it. And it'll tell you to do something. Oh, you discover monster tracks. Do you investigate? If you do, roll a dice. And if you roll this, you get this, and etc., etc., etc. There are a number of events that can happen. And once it's done, you can remove the card and push everyone else up. And then you pick the next survivor to reveal the next card. And you take it and you resolve it and you do whatever it says to do. Great. These generic events, though, will tell you to have a random event, which you have to refer to the book. There are a hundred random events and you determine which event you reveal by rolling the two D10s, one of them being the white one, and using the white dice as the tens number. So here I have 62. We refer to the book here, look for event number 62, and read the instructions, yada, yada, yada. Popular things that happen during these events is you find items, which can be useful, uh, you take damage, but keep in mind that this is known as event damage. If let's say our survivors all had to take 10 event damage to the chest, that sounds devastating. It sounds like you're gonna die before the showdown even happens. Yes, but no. Event damage means that, yes, you do have to suffer the damage, but you cannot suffer a severe injury because of event damage. So it can take you to zero and it may even cause you to incur a heavy injury, but you won't get a severe injury, which means you cannot die. So it's good and it's bad. When you are one space away from the monster and you move on to it, you don't reveal the event under it. Instead, you start the showdown phase. And those are the three phases of the game. You hunt the monster, you fight the monster, and then you decide what to do with the monster's spleen. Do you make it into a sweet axe 
or do you make a hat? You might be wondering, what is this space here in the middle? It has the book icon, which means it is a story event in the book. You turn to the page and you read it. Don't want to spoil it for you? You can read it for yourself if and when you have the book in your own hands. This is just a crash course on Kingdom Death Monster. I want to thank you all for sitting through this tutorial and for supporting me over the years and months that I've been away. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more tutorials, make sure you subscribe to the channel. And if you have any questions, as I'm sure you probably have dozens about all the many mechanics I did not cover in this tutorial, leave them in the comment section below. If you are interested in seeing me play through a campaign of Kingdom Death Monster, let me know because I would like to do a campaign where all the survivors are subscribers. So if you want to see this happen, subscribe to the channel. Give me a comment saying, yes, I want to see Kingdom Death Monster played. And if you want to see some expansions thrown in as well, let me know which expansions you'd like to see in the comments below. But anyway, that's it. That's Kingdom Death Monster. Thank you all so much for watching. See you all next time. And don't forget to keep on rolling.